two main justifications for science, and one of them, I suppose, is the utilitarian one, that it's, that it's useful and we, you need, I mean, pe people will, will justify saving rainforests because you can get medicine from tree bark and things like that. Um, but I agree with what you've just said, that there's something much more important, which is the sort of poetic uh, benefit of science. The, the utilitarian benefits of science are not a good enough reason. I think it's rather like, I've used this example before, it's rather like saying that the point about music is that it's good <coughs> exercise for the violinist's right arm. <laughs> Science is much more like music in the sense of the aesthetic appreciation of music. And just as you don't have to learn an instrument like the violin in order to appreciate music at a very high level, so you can appreciate science and you can enjoy science and you can feel the thrill of the aesthetic thrill of science without actually being a scientist. So you don't have to have made a youthful study of the Bunsen burner uh, in order to uh, appreciate the, the music of the spheres, the, uh, the majesty of the heavens, the, uh, the majesty in another sense of the, of the, of the geological record, the, the, the sheer uh, age of the, of the rocks, the uh, immense complexity of a single living cell, let alone the immense complexity of the trillions of living cells that is each, that is each one of you. So, <laughs> and, so um, I, I, I suppose that, that Neil, what Neil was talking about, is kind of intermediate between the violinist's right arm, the the, um, uh, the utilitarian mundane value of science and the, the Carl Sagan sort of poetic value of science, the, 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 the advantage of the scientific way of thinking, of not getting a, a cockeyed view of the world in which you find yourself. Science has developed methods of avoiding fooling yourself. Scientists are not necessarily more honest people than anybody else, but the methods of science have honesty built into them. We have peer review, we have uh, the necessity for experiments to be repeated before they're taken seriously. We have the, um, the, the virtue of inter-observer correlation. It, it shouldn't matter who does the experiment. If the experiment is done in Japan or America or India, if the experiment's done properly, it should get the same result. Scientists don't appeal to authority. That kind of... Uh, correct view of reality as opposed to a tradition view of reality or a revelation view of, of reality, that is, seems to me to be a, a third of that virtue of science which lies intermediate between the violinist's right arm on the one hand and the Carl Sagan at the, in, the, in the upper stratosphere of poetry. The big problem that we have in science education is we just do not teach science well. I always felt we never had a chance to really talk about what what physics was all about. And when I tried to do that, there was no interest in it. It was just the students sat there, you know, oh, is this going to be on the test? <laughs> and, uh, and, and one of the uh, aspects of science that we're supposed to uh, emphasize is critical thinking. And I don't know where in a science curriculum anybody learns any critical thinking. Yeah, Neil. Uh, Victor, I think you're under, under recognizing the value of your life experience in, that, in those roles. Let me offer anecdotal, though it is, uh, reflections on just your point. Um, people who are in school and maybe in a physics class, and perhaps they don't want to become a physicist or an engineer, they'll say, why do I have, why do I have to learn about a frictionless pulley on an inclined plane with a massless <laughs> I mean, How will I ever use this? And it, in fact, you will never in your life encounter a frictionless pulley on a <laughs> massless pulley on a frictionless inclined plane. Never, ever will that ever come up. Yet, it's a physics problem in the physics book. And so, I understand this, of course. However, there's something else going on there that we forget as educators, and particularly as physics educators. And that is 
in order to solve the problem in the first place, there's a new wiring of the brain that gets connected. And even after you forget the details of having solved the problem, the wiring in the brain that was established to have solved the problem lingers on. And I see this in the minds of adults. For example, Richard Holbrook, who you may remember as the American ambassador to the UN during uh, Clinton, this, he's a neighbor of the American Museum of Natural History, where, where it's my day job up there, in case you <laughs> at the Hayden Planetarium. He, he wanted to take a tour of the newly built Rose Center at Hayden Planetarium right after we uh, built it. And so I'm, get, I'm, I'm you know, I build the place, so I give the guy the tour. And I start describing the moon, the planets, the stars, and he starts asking questions. And he says, is it true that if the moon is aligned this way, you get this phase before this eclipse takes place? I said, well, yeah, actually, but yeah. We're walking around, and he says, well, if this galaxy rotates, does that, uh, do the stars move through the gas clouds, or is it all one? So, oh, well, actually, it goes this way, and you trigger a star. And he's asking questions deep in the content. And I say, now, wait a minute, you're like a politician. You're, 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 a, you're a negotiator in, 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 the, in the Balkans. What? What? Where is this? What? And he said, oh, 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 so I, I, I took physics when I was in college before I shifted over into international law. And then it was just plainly obvious that this man had solved frictionless pulley problems because he, he, could, he knew how to get to the, to the essence of a problem. And then I asked him, how does that reveal itself in the negotiating table? You as a politician, how does this show up? He said, you know immediately who's basically full of it and who isn't. Because they're, they're constructing alternative realities that have no foundation in the real reality. And so, so Victor, I'll, don't, don't, don't give up on yourself too quickly. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Very good. I should, I should mention that uh, I grew up in this area and when I was about 15, uh, my mother took me to the Hayden Planetarium. It was around 1950 or something like that. And uh, that really got me into science. So Neil, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. And, and I, have to, I have to admit that uh, uh, there's something happening in the process. I'm just, I'm just claiming that uh, uh, the people who are coming out are still not uh, thinking uh, critically the way we want. They, why is it that so many of them, for example, still uh, will come out of the science education and, and, and still believe in religion? I mean, it's just, uh, this is a uh, is there a, when you walk into a church, is there a a place there where you uh, leave your brains, is, is deposit brains here, or, and uh, this is something I think we've all had had to puzzle about. Uh, Richard, yeah, Richard. Yeah. In in biology education, we have very much the same kind of problems, but we have one massive additional problem, which is that the central theorem of biology is evolution, uh, and. In the case of evolution, uh, well, there are, of course, difficulties in understanding evolution, which are genuine difficulties, which are comparable to those in understanding physics. Uh, in order to really understand evolution, you have to get your mind around incomprehensible time spans. Nobody can really grasp what a million years means, let alone what a hundred million years means, because we are, our brains on the Pleistocene of Africa were geared to understanding time spans of seconds, minutes, hours, days, years, decades, maybe at most centuries. We can't cope with a million years, we certainly can't cope with a hundred million years, and yet you've got to, or you won't understand evolution. Similarly, uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous interference put up by the fact that we are an artifact creating species, and therefore when we see a mechanism like an eye, a biological mechanism like an eye, our mind instantly leaps to artifacts and we instantly think there has to be a, a, a maker. And these are all legitimate difficulties which are soluble by patient explanation and I've devoted my whole adult life to trying to
pro provide such explanations. But we have to face the fact that in the case of evolution, we have one massive roadblock to education, and that is religion. Uh, because in the case of evolution, I think almost uniquely in science, maybe, maybe the Big Bang is not subject to similar problems, we have a competing worldview which is uh, actively engaged in a political process of deliberate subversion of the educational process. And so, whereas a physicist who is trying to get across the charms of balls sliding down inclined planes, etc., has the ordinary problems of education and with um, yet students wondering whether it's going to be on the test, biologists have all that problem as well, but they have the additional problem that the student will say, oh, I don't believe that because I'm a who named it? Muslim or uh, Catholic or whatever. Uh, I was on, sorry, no, please. I was on a, uh, I was visiting a school uh, a few days ago doing a filming project and was talking to these children for, it was maybe 15 or 16 year olds about evolution. And time and again, I would get somebody who would say, oh, well, I, I, I know that's what we're told in school, but I don't believe that because I'm a Muslim. It says in the Quran, or it says in, in, the, in the Bible. And I put it to them straight, do you mean to say that if the evidence says so-and-so, and your holy book, whichever one it happens to be, says the, it says the opposite, do you mean you prefer your holy book over the evidence? And they said, of course we would. Uh, there was no question about it. 15, 16. In England, in London. Uh, there, was, there was one young man who, who was raised, raised Muslim, and he was totally close-minded, more than just close-minded in the ordinary way that any of us might be close-minded. His mind had been systematically closed by an educational process in early childhood, and it's a, a, a massive additional barrier that we have to face as educators in the field of evolution. I, I have to uh, make a quick agreement with uh, Richard here. Um, at the planetarium, we have a, a, a tandem projection space where we recreate the first few moments of the universe in what we call the Big Bang experience. And of course, this is part of a larger museum of natural history. And occasionally, I'm confronted by a religious person who wants to ask, well, where is the religious view of the beginning of the universe? And so rather than actually engage them in that conversation, I, I send them over to the Hall of Evolutionary Biology. And then they never come back. <laughs> they never make it back to me. Because in those halls we have chimpanzees holding hands with human skeletons. And, they, and so they just never show up again. So forgive me, but I'm sending them all over to you. <laughs> But uh, I'm sorry, the, your, the question... The, just that it, while it appears there's consensus that religion deserves the biggest bullseye in terms of it being the biggest impediment to science education, but there are other... Well, I, I, mean, I forgot to mention postmodernism, but or, um, I mean, there, there, there is a kind of view which is, which is being put about in uh, social science and arts departments of universities, that there's nothing special about science, and science is just one version of truth, and your version of truth is just as good as my version of truth and, and uh, we all decide what's true for us uh, and never mind about evidence. Who says evidence is important? Isn't evidence just a, a white male supremacist concept anyway? <laughs> the common uh, statement that uh, you hear, where did, uh, how, how come, where did they, uh, the universe come from? Uh, why is there something rather than Nothing simply answers the question, why is there something rather than nothing? And that is that nothing is unstable. Nothing is not the most natural state. Something is the more natural state of existence. Yeah, but Victor, okay. But, <laughs> no, I'm okay with that, but even if we didn't yet have an answer to it, we should not be ashamed of not having answers to all questions yet. So you shouldn't somehow take the list of questions that the religious community poses to science and say, well, what was around before the Big Bang? And there were this and after death. And, then, and I say, I don't know yet. And go on to the next problem. And, and I'm perfectly happy staring somebody in the face saying, I don't know yet. 
I, and we got top people working on it. And, and so, the, the moment you feel compelled to provide an answer, then you're doing the same thing that the religious community does, providing answers to every possible question. By the way, what science also does is not only answer well-posed questions, it also can put you in a position to judge whether, in fact, the question has meaning in the first place. And because not just because you put nouns and verbs in the right sequence doesn't mean your question has to have any sense at all. If you, if you ask, what is the square root of a pork chop? That doesn't, at, at what temperature does the numeral seven melt? These, just because you ask that question doesn't obligate me to say, hey, let's let's from the lab to answer it. And so, so science inquiry is also half of that effort is constructing the questions in the first place.